Blessings to you on this last Sunday in June, and welcome to worship with Northminster Presbyterian Church. We are so grateful that you are with us on this very special Sunday, a Sunday when we begin worship gathering at the font here in the sanctuary, though momentarily we will be with this same font a little closer to the outside as we celebrate our first baptisms in over a year as this day we are reminded that here in our baptisms we find the identity that makes us one family that calls us together as those who are made one here this day and every day let us worship god together join me on this beautiful Sunday morning. Um, join me in our call to worship. Let us worship the triune God. Let us worship the one who spoke in the beginning and created something out of nothing. Let us worship the triune God. Let us worship the one who took on the clothing of humanity to set those who were oppressed free. Let us worship the triune God. Let us worship the one whose spirit rests continually upon us, calling us from sorrow-filled endings to bright new beginnings. Let us worship God. God, as we come from places far and near, we give thanks that wherever we are, you bind us to yourself this day. You reach out to draw us ever closer, that we might feel the brush of your grace soft upon us, that we might feel the healing touch of your compassion resting gently within us. You bind us to yourself this day, Heir of glory and grace, you keep us by your side, that we might walk with you through the streets of your commonwealth, bringing hope to the despairing, offering consolation to the brokenhearted, sharing love with those tossed aside by the world. You bind us to yourself this day, spirit of justice. You fill our hearts with living water that they might overflow to parched people, you teach us how to give ourselves away so we might take on the burdens of others. We bind ourselves to you this day, God in community, 
fully in one, even as we pray the words Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, on this day, I invite you to embrace the spirit, the peace of Jesus Christ. A peace that passes all understanding, a peace that is not easy, but a peace that is abiding. Friends, embrace this peace of Jesus Christ. Receive it as your own. And then with joy, I invite you to share it with one another, with those whom with you, who you worship with physically this day and with those you worship with virtually. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Hello, children. I am so glad to be with you today. And I am so glad to be with you at the baptismal font. Many of you probably haven't seen this in a really long time, uh, but today is the day when we get to celebrate baptisms in our congregation. We have not done this for over a year. And on this day, we give God thanks for the gift of baptism and the way that it is an incredible hug from God into God's family. Yesterday, in a beautiful outdoor service, uh, Pastor Michael and I baptized Doug, Doug Balkan and his son, William Balkan. As you will see in just a few moments, it was a small ceremony, just friends and uh, family but it was an opportunity for the Northminster community to come together in spirit and through um, our assistant clerk of session, Amber Yancey Carroll being present with us, representing you all um, to do this sacrament of the church of God and to welcome Doug and Will into God's family and into our own. It is incredible what God is able to do through the cleansing of water. Water, a visible sign of God's invisible grace. The act of baptism is one that is done not because of anything that we do, but all because of who God is. Doug and William become part of God's family and our family, not because of anything they've done, but because of who they are because they are made in the image of God. They are God's children. And this day, we rejoice that Doug and Will, William are part not only of God's family, but also Northminster's family. And I can't wait for you to get to uh, know William. Um, he'll be in the nursery for a while, but then nursery school and his older sister, Ada. And um, it will be such fun for you to uh, be friends with them and play with them and get to know the love of Jesus uh, with them. So friends, let's pray. Holy and gracious God, who gives us all great big hugs of love all the time, we celebrate today that Doug and his son William are part of your family and of ours. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the gift of baptism and for your incredible grace and the way that it claims us as your own and that it gives us the courage to go out into the world um, as Christians to share your love with other people. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us worship God. Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given.
given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. Hear these words from the Holy Scripture. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God, and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in all. Obeying the word of our Lord Jesus, confident of his promises, we baptize those whom God has called. In baptism, God claims us and seals us to show that we belong to God. God frees us from sin and death, uniting us with Jesus Christ. recite a statement of faith. At this time, we will include in our service the joint faith statement of our 2021 confirmation class. To me, Northminster is dedicated to loving God with all its heart, mind, and soul, and loving our neighbors as ourselves. I believe there is only one God who has received Received him, revealed himself as our Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. One of the teachings of Jesus that stands out to me the most is loving others the way you love yourself, treating people with forgiveness. I think everyone should try to follow those teachings. I will admit I need to follow those teachings as well. I believe we all need to work on following those teachings to make a better world. That was Tao and this is Ashlyn. We don't always think about the Holy Spirit, no, nor do we always see it around us in our day-to-day -day lives. Yet the Holy Spirit is everywhere and in everyone. I look, to, at the, I look at the Holy Spirit as a friend, one that guides me and will always be right beside me through thick and thin. Because I know this, I will never be alone. And now Sydney. Although my faith in Jesus Christ is not the most classic thing, I do believe that Jesus is my Lord and Savior, and it is still there. My journey may not include things that a typical Christian might do, but I know that I can make sure that I'll continue to seek ways to serve others. One of the missions of the church is to show God's love, and we do this by giving service to others. I love doing service projects and always have. Something I connected with from confirmation class is that by doing service projects, I am sharing God's love. Family Promise and Working Bikes are both service projects I have been pretty involved in. And next is Charlotte. Going to church is really important to me. Church isn't just about worship, it's a place where everyone can connect with each other, create friendships, and feel empathy towards each other. We all gather together and talk about our beliefs and our questions. 
and next is Connor. Sometimes it is not your own belief that strengthens your resolve, but the sincere belief of others. From seeing others take a leap of faith, not knowing and not seeing that there is God, but yet believing so strongly in one, it has reinforced my position. And Caitlin. People who teach you more about Christianity are some of the most important people because they are the biggest reason you can get so close to God. The people who have supported me through this crazy journey have helped me learn even more than I ever thought I could learn. I have never loved being who I am more than I do now, and I have never felt so close to God as I am after going through confirmation class. Genevra. My great grandma Isabel was always a big part of our church. She was very committed to her faith, relationships, family, and community. She didn't turn those away who sinned, always having forgiveness in her heart. I loved and respected her as much as anyone I've ever known. She was a strong leader and I try to bring those qualities into my life. And last is Thomas. I'm joining the church because I want to be able to explore my questions with others and be able to look within myself to ask myself what questions I need to ask. The church has a, has a community where I feel I can explore, where I can, I can feel like I can explore that. I feel like when I'm in the church, I have a sense of community where no one's opinion is wrong. We can share ideas and become better people because of it. We can explore theology and ask questions. That's a good thing to me. That's what I love about the church and why I want to become part of it. Friends, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give, give our thanks, thanks and praise. We give you thanks, eternal God, for you nourish and sustain all living things beginning of time, the spirit moved over the watery chaos, calling forth order and life. In the time of Noah, you destroyed evil by the waters of the flood, giving righteousness a new beginning. You led Israel out of slavery through the waters of the sea into the freedom of the promised land. In the waters of Jordan, Jesus was baptized by John and anointed by your spirit. By the baptism of your own death and resurrection, Christ set us free from sin and death and opened the way to eternal life. We thank you, O God, for these waters of baptism. In them we are buried with Christ in his death, and from them we are raised to share in his resurrection. Through them we are reborn by the power of the Holy Spirit. Send your spirit to move over this water, that it may be a fountain of deliverance and rebirth. Wash away the sin of all who are cleansed by it. Raise them to new life and graft them to the body of Christ. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon them that they may have power to do your will. Continue forever in the risen life of Christ. To you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, be praise, glory, and honor now and forever. Amen. Amen. Baptism, we use, there are two steps. The first is the 
baptism of water. And then our tradition says that the anointing with oil is a traditional way that represents both the healing of the life of faith, but also oil was used to anoint people into their calling into service in the church. So baptism is the, is the creation of the identity. Chrismation is the, the cleaning of or the sending out in the call to service, to a life of service and love and discipleship. And so it's with great joy that we also anoint you, brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And that will be a little spot on your forehead for a little bit. And it will be to remind you that you have been claimed, that you are, will be sent out into the world to live the life of faith now and all your days. And it's really cool to remember. You'll get to remember this when everybody else gets to remember it too. final tradition that we do here at Northminster is the candle for baptism. It is a reminder as we begin each service, and I knew they would blow out. <laughs> oh, oh, and there they are again. Oh, wow. They're like those birthday candles. So as we begin each service, we light the candle in the sanctuary as a sign that the Spirit is present among us. And you may remember that it's been a while since we were worshiping in there together, but the, that we typically walk the light out that the spirit of life goes with us. So each of you will have with you to take with you today your own light, your own candle, as a reminder now and always that you carry the spirit of life with you when you are away to the prayer baptism all the time in the presence of the spirit with you. So we will be here for you to take with you. as you see it on your screen. God, whose greatness defies our limited dictionary of praise, we come to your word with cautious curiosity. Grant us the ears, eyes, and hands of your spirit, so that we may boldly hear your truth, clearly see the path you have set before us, and humbly seek to build communities of love and justice to your eternal glory. Amen.
Friends, now I invite you to hear our first scripture reading of the day from our prophet Isaiah, chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Today, I invite you to hear these familiar words of vivid images and of a grand calling in a fresh way. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the thresholds shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me! I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Our second reading today comes to us from Paul's letter to the church at Rome, from the eighth chapter, beginning at the twelfth verse. Listen for a word from God for us today. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if, in fact, we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 30 million at-home DNA tests. More than half from Ancestry.com and about 10 million from 23andMe.com. That's how many of those kits have been filled out and sent in. 30 million people and their families trying to answer the question, who did I come from? Most of those tests cost between $50 and $100 to process. That's somewhere between $1.5 and $3 billion to find out not where you came from, but if you have genetic markers that are similar to those of people who came from a region or a nationality. Why do we do it? Because we hope to find a relative that's famous or important? Because we want to test family folklore stories about great-great-grandma having Choctaw mother or father? Because we are simply curious to better understand just who we are and where we come from? It's worth noting that this whole dis obsession, perhaps, with ancestry and trying to trace it has some troubling racist and white privilege roots in our country. The one drop of blood rules in the South where one black ancestor, no matter how far back, could get you labeled legally black for all purposes. So preservation of family trees furthered a racist agenda. And then there's the reality that many of us <clears throat> have a European, who have a European ancestry have the privilege <clears throat> of baptismal and birth records to turn to when many others must turn to workhouse court orders or bills of sale or slave tax inventories if they want to trace their families back more than five or six generations. All over the globe, 
who you can prove you came from has been very important almost for all time. Caste systems, legally defined class distinctions, ancestral chattel slavery, primogenitor, these are all ways entire lives were legally determined by who was family for you. But there have been so many informal ways who your people are defined life for so many. The opportunities of the ruling classes and generational oppression of the working classes, those who get to be upstairs and those who must live their lives downstairs. That questionnaire to qualify for the daughters of the American Revolution or the sons of the Confederacy. We spent centuries determining worth and value and comparative importance because of who we come from. The Christians that Paul was writing to in Rome are just beginning to feel the heat of the who are your people question, though not so much because of birth, but because of common identity. The emperor had not too long before decided that Christians, a small minority in the empire, would make a convenient scapegoat as things began to go wrong. They had already been banned in Rome once and were on thin ice when Paul was writing this letter of teaching and encouragement to them in advance of his first planned trip to see them. Are you one of those people from the wrong side of the empire? Paul has something to say about that today if they're worried about that. It is fairly easy to see why this is a text chosen for Trinity Sunday. In five short verses, we have Paul speaking of the Spirit, God as Father, and Christ. Of course, Paul isn't remotely concerned about a doctrine of the Trinity. It wasn't developed by the church until long after his death. And he isn't concerned about trying to explain the relationships among and between the three persons we say we believe are all part of the one God we worship. Paul really isn't concerned with that at all, and to be honest, I don't think we need to spend too much time on that today either. Why argue about a mystery that will never be solved until we are all dead and gone and can ask God ourselves? What is important to Paul in this passage is that even in the days before a formal doctrine of the Trinity had been developed, his key language for and thoughts about the Spirit, Christ, and God can best be articulated using the language of family. Children of God. Abba, Father. Abba. That word that doesn't mean daddy, no matter what we've been taught. It's more correctly means something like my honored father, it's a term of deep intimacy, but not something casual, something deeply referential. And then there are those other words, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, and adoption. To be someone's heir is typically to be their child, traditionally their legitimate child by birth for much of human history. Children born outside of marriage only gained inheritance rights in many cultures relatively recently, and some still don't have it. The one historic exception was adoption, in which someone who had no heirs could perpetuate a family line by adopting and thereby creating an heir at law. In most cultures, under most laws, until very recently though, when there was an heir by birth, an adopted child could not, could almost never displace that living heir. So where there was a child, another adopted child would not be a co-heir, but always a subservient one. But here is Paul, 2,000 years ago, suggesting that the family of God works on different rules. Christ may be God's one true child, that creates all kinds of confusion in the Trinity in and of itself, but there we are. 
we, I mean, there we are, adopted into God's love and God's family, made joint heirs with Christ himself. It defies logic and law. What does it mean, then, that we are joint heirs with Christ? And what does it mean to be the adopted children of God? In Paul's time, to be adopted was to have one's terrible life turned on its ear in a moment, Greco-Roman households were all about family and patriarchal power and protection. To be eligible for adoption, one had to be without a family, without a household, without any social safety net, without any social identity at all, or with one so inferior that it could easily be let go of. But once one was adopted, there was security, a home, a future, there was a place to belong, assurance that one was not alone. The spirit of adoption that Paul speaks of is designed to help his fellow followers of Jesus persevere, but it also asks something of them. To claim status as joint heirs with Christ of the kingdom of God, it meant surrendering, defining themselves by loyalty to any other household. To say, this is where I will claim my identity. This is where my loyalty will lie. With the family of God. This family where even God is defined somehow as a community. This family where I am a joint heir, never able to lord a more superior status over anyone else. Never less an inheritor of the family's blessings than anyone else. Can we grasp just how radical that idea was then and now? We have spent a good deal of the last year acknowledging and beginning the work of identifying and making baby steps toward dismantling those ideas and systems within ourselves and our culture that are based on white supremacy, one of the defining social loyalties of our nation's history. Paul would approve us doing that. But he would also remind us that there are many other loyalties, many other definitions we have used and still use to stratify ourselves into more worthy and less worthy heirs of the world. Race, yes, but nationality, education, intellect, wealth, gender, family status, appearance, disability, religion, body type, all of these identities, all of these loyalties, Paul assures us, if we define ourselves principally by them, will leave us both feeling and being incomplete. To accept that we are heirs apparent to the kingdom of God is to come to terms with the radical reality that no other status is ultimate in the grand scheme of things. And all those other statuses have value principally in how we dwell within them as a means to joyfully, lovingly embody our belovedness as fellow children of God, as fellow heirs in the kingdom with Christ and with one another. It doesn't mean that we aren't all those other things. Just as adopted children don't give up the reality of their ethnic, cultural, or racial identities if adopted into families where those particular identities are more diverse. But it does mean that ideally, the love that creates the adoptive family becomes the central defining status and creates the space for all of those other identities to be explored and celebrated without fear of rejection or inferiority. We live in the midst of a congregation where generations of adopted children and adoptive parents have helped embody Paul's vision of the family of God. We have all seen and celebrated those families where there are no half this or step that, no real this and adopted that as though those are some kind of opposite of one another. We've seen them, we've learned from them, and we give thanks for them. There once was a boy, 
We'll call him Stephen. Stephen had several sisters and brothers, and theirs was a fairly typical suburban family. Some of them looked alike, some of them didn't. Some of them got along very well, some of them didn't. It, wasn't, it was a fairly large family by today's standards, and they were as happy or as sad as most other families. One day, quite by accident, Stephen discovered that his oldest sibling had been adopted by their father, years after having been abandoned by their mother's first husband, his sibling's birth father. Stephen was shocked. How could that be possible? After all, it wasn't something they talked about. There was no way anyone looking at their family could ever have known. And suddenly, Stephen became curious about the things that made his older sibling's life different from his own. He started looking for ways to see this beloved one as other. He said some hurtful things, perhaps not understanding that he was undermining their very identity as a family. One morning, Stephen's father came to him and said the rough equivalent of, let's have a talk, son. Stephen knew that tone. It meant I'm going to say something and you're going to listen. I know you're curious, his father told him, but you need to understand something. He took a document out of his pocket and handed it to Stephen. Here, take a look at this. And with that, Stephen opened the document to see that it was a copy of something carrying the title, Amended Birth Certificate. The amended birth certificate for Stephen's older sibling. And he could see that under father on the certificate, it listed his father's name their father's name. But, but what about Stephen started? After the adoption, his father explained, the court amended the birth certificate. For anything that matters, as far as it is anyone else's business, for every purpose that is important, you are all my children. No different. Do you understand? And Stephen did. Today, we baptized a father and a son. They will be father and child all of their lives together, and Betsy and Doug have made and will surely keep promises for this little one for all of his and their days. But in their baptisms, Doug and William also became siblings joint heirs with you and me, with all of us, and for anything eternal, as far as it is God's business, for every eternal purpose that is truly important, Betsy and Doug and Will will all be joint heirs with Christ and with all of us in the kingdom of God. They will have that identity to cling to, perhaps especially on the days when being parent and child will be tough, when doors slam or eyes roll or patience wears thin. And we have that identity to cling to as well, when enmity and passion strains but surely does not break the bonds which forge us together as joint heirs with Christ as fellow children of God. And we have that certainty, that security, that belonging, that future. So when we wonder who we are, or feel tempted to define ourselves in ways that will surely leave us feeling inadequate, may that divine love that creates our eternal adoptive family become for us, too, the central defining status of each of our lives, creating the space for all of our other identities to be explored and celebrated without fear, without inferiority. For that is the promise of our adoptive family. Thanks be to God. Amen. Sois and
Again, a warm welcome to you as you worship with us on this beautiful Sunday morning or Tuesday afternoon, whenever you are worshiping with us, we are glad that you are here. And a special welcome to you if this is the first time that you've tuned in for Northminster's worship. Thanks for pressing play and for tuning in for this worship experience. This is a great time to be finding our faith community. After months of pre-recorded and FaceTime worship services, I am thrilled to share that soon we will again be opening our sanctuary doors and letting people worship in person. Our live streaming equipment is being installed this week, which is a huge step in our reopening process. Please keep your eye open for emails with more information about our reopening steps. As we continue this reopening process, we continue to be grateful for the ways that we are able to connect with one another virtually. After this worship service, there will be a time of connection and conversation during our coffee hour via Zoom, and we invite you all to press that link and come and be with us, even if you can only be with us for a few minutes. This week is rather quiet with the holiday, uh, but we do have an upstander training opportunity that is happening Thursday evening at 7 p.m., led by Pastor Michael. This training is being done in collaboration with St. Luke's in Evanston, and we already have some folks from St. Luke's who have signed up. So it will be a wonderful opportunity for you to get to meet some folks from Evanston who are engaged and um, yearning to know more about what it is to be an upstander. So if you need to refresh your skills or are learning how to be an upstander for the first time, come on Thursday, 7 p.m. Uh, you'll find the link in Wednesday's email. And now um, I offer one last time a plea for any graduation information that you would like to share with us. Um, tomorrow is the final day that we will be receiving information about your graduate who is graduating from high school or college or graduate school so that we can put together all of that information into a beautiful video expression of celebration and congratulations that will be available to the congregation next Sunday, June 6th. We are so grateful to Luciana Bonadio for putting that together. Um, as our communications coordinator, and this year, a fellow graduate um, who just completed her master's work at Loyola University in digital storytelling. And so, um, one last push, tomorrow's our last day for receiving any of that information you'd like to share. Thank you for all those who have already shared that info, and thanks to those of you who are going to do so. And now, as we hear this arrangement of holy, holy, holy is the Lord, I invite you to just sit back and relax, maybe close your eyes and just think about all of the ways that our God, who is most holy, has um, been bound to you in ways that have made you 
uh, able to share love and compassion and kindness with others in unexpected and amazing ways. I invite you too to think about how you have been empowered to do so through your engagement with this congregation um, and think about how you might further that engagement um, with giving more of your time or perhaps financial resources um, to further the ministry that happens um, within and of course beyond the walls of Northminster Presbyterian Church. siblings in God. On this day, when our church is remade for the second week in a row by the addition of new members, when we celebrate our adoption into the family of God as those who are made one, let us confidently go from this place, carrying that unity with us, carrying that identity with us, not to separate us from others, but actually to draw us to them, to find in them our common identity, our common adoption by the God who created us, the Christ who even now sustains us, and the Spirit who will journey with us in every moment. And all God's people said, 